Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friends of the Force, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, Brad. And I'm your host, Sarah. And this week on the show, we are back talking about the Bad Batch episodes 308 through 311. We got a little four-parter here for you today. Oh, man, I am reeling. I'm not feeling good in these chilies tonight. Multiple chilies, all the chilies. I want to get off the train. I want to get off the ship. I feel bad. Feels bad. I feel like I feel like I immediately finished 311 and was like, okay, uh, how do I sleep until next week? How do I? <laughs> okay, come on. Can I watch the next one? <laughs> like, I, I honestly feel like on the edge of my seat um, and like really excited to see how the show will conclude. Um, so, yeah, bring it on. But also these episodes were fascinating and painful and really good. I feel like the show, again, is is just continuing to hit a stride where everything just feels so meaty, yeah. feels a very emotional, but just with how episode 11 ends, and again, spoiler talk for all of you listening, if you haven't watched the show, uh, with where the show is going to be going the rest of the season, I feel like we're in for some, uh, for some dark stuff, potentially, and knowing what we know about Mount Tantis and what's actually going on there, and with Omega coming back. Uh, that is going to just be a whole thing. Uh, but I think it's going to give her a lot of purpose and, uh, make her feel more compelled to carry out the mission. You know, aside from just the clones that are there, it's also, uh, we learned children who are on Mount Tantus and being (laughs) experimented on, right? Not good. And it's so interesting when you think about how the show started, uh, like one of the first couple of episodes, if you remember, was when they went to that one planet and there was the farmer clone. With his kid. Yeah. And Omega. When she touches grass for the first time quite yeah. literally. Yeah. And they're having like their play date and Omega makes a friend. And the more I thought about this episode throughout today, I was like, wow, that kind of coming full circle now where Omega is coming to the rescue of other kids. Mm. Uh, and so that's just really, it's really compelling. But uh, before we jump too far ahead, we, again, we got four episodes to cover. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Bad Territory, uh, which... If I could describe this episode, Sarah, it was like if if the Florida man rides an alligator headline was an episode of a Star Wars series. I think (laughs) that this would be an apt description of uh, (laughs) this fun, zany, on a pontoon the whole time kind of episode (laughs) with uh, Fennec Wrecker and Hunter. It was was a fun fun one. It was a good one. When you you were like, Sarah, this episode gives me Florida man vibes or like Florida vibes, I was like... All right, let's go. <laughs> and then I watched it and it it does give yeah. Florida vibes. But it also gives us probably most notably uh the return of Fennec Shand. Yay! Everybody cheered. <laughs> everybody. I think anytime Mingna Wen is in Star Wars, it's always a like a net positive for everybody. It's never a negative. Yeah. I mean, yes. I, we first of all Yes. Um, but it, I thought it was so interesting to see her back because ultimately, like the idea behind this episode is that they want to learn more about uh, the M count and what it is and uh, why it's so important. And so, you know, we find out that they've been hiring bounty hunters to steal these kids. We see more of this as uh, these episodes go on. <laughs> I hate it here. <laughs> um, and, um, and, we go on a side quest in order to start to get that information. Um, so I thought that was really, we didn't get to it as fast as I really wanted to personally, but I felt like the Florida man adventure was overall pretty (laughs) fun. Having Fennec back was a good time. And also like, we kind of get this moment of like, what side is Fennec on? And she kind of addresses that too. And she's like, you know, I'll do my part. You do your part. But then at the end, you know, (laughs) <laughs> I almost got the impression that she wasn't taking M count target jobs. I think somebody asked her. Yeah, it felt it felt like an intentional choice by her to not take those. And maybe it's because, as we, we see later on, some of these targets are, are literal toddlers. And so maybe it's an ethic, which I, I, I hate to like say it's an ethics thing when it comes to being a bounty hunter, because like you, you do things for the money. And even Wrecker makes that point to her that he says, like, you'll just do anything if you get paid for it. And I don't know if that's necessarily true with Fennec. I think Fennec maybe has more of a heart than somebody like Cad Bane. I think Cad Bane is, like, way too far gone. Uh, And it's interesting, too, because we know Cad Bane and Fennec eventually 
fight in the book of Boba Fett series and, and, and uh, Boba Fett and all that. But I, I found that kind of interesting that maybe and, and considering she's in cahoots with Asajj and she knows to tell Asajj where these clones are and that they're wondering about M count. We know Asajj is somebody who's not taking any sides either. Right. So is it more of a, con- you know, I'm having my contacts and I'm establishing a network or is Fennec inclined to have a, a contact like Asajj Venturist because maybe they kind of align on their opinion of the Empire and what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a really interesting thought because, you know, she very easily could take these M count jobs, I think, and probably do them well. She's good at her job. She's a fierce bounty hunter. Um, but having both this episode and the next episode with Asajj be about these characters who kind of exist in the middle somewhere um, is ultimately more compelling and and thoughtful than them being on either side you know I I think I think it would be foolish of any of us to assume that either of them would be like freedom fighters for for the rebellion or anything like that but but they're definitely not the empire's biggest fans and waving their foam finger uh number one fan um (laughs) yeah Fennec, Fennec's heart is not completely corrupted by greed like a little bit you know like she's a bounty hunter still right but maybe not as far gone as some other folks who are, again, like waving the foam finger, like you're saying, <laughs> the number one foam right. finger. Or like, or like, yeah, I'll root for this team. No prob, Bob. Like, um, but the other, the other really, I think, valuable uh, piece of this episode um, was the Crosshair and Omega relationship continuing um, because one thing in this episode that has been so wonderful is Crosshair and Omega. Uh, mm-hmm. I am so glad to see them together because they are such opposites and they complement each other so well. Um, it's like uh, it, it, there's like a great there's a reason why like people love grumpy sunshine pairings of any kind. Like they, there's a good interplay between somebody who's just really happy about life or and somebody who's telling them no at every turn and they kind of have that dynamic where where omega she just is full of life and hope and and optimism even when it comes to crosshair and crosshair is like i'm old and jaded and i'm not the man i once was i'm having you know this tremor it's a problem and she's like um you know it could get better and you just have to let yourself think that um and that's how it will and i really like that i'm really liking that they get to have that sort of relationship where she kind of gets to um attempt to soften him a little bit Mm -hmm. totally and i think it's interesting because she's technically the older sister oh totally and there's a moment where when omega leads crosshair to go meditate on the rock and he learns that she learned it from Gunji when she visited Kashyyyk and he says, you visited Kashyyyk. And so I think that's a moment of realization for him that he missed out on a lot of the past year or so of, of their lives. And right. the fact that Omega, despite being perceived as young and looking young, although she again is, is technically older um, and she's bringing a lot of experiences with her as well, that, crosshair was not privy to and crosshair can learn a thing or two from from omega it's it's that idea that don't let age deceive you in in terms of what you can learn from younger generation younger quote unquote younger generations uh, in this case omega again but it's it's kind of fascinating that she she offers this idea to crosshair and he says i am i gonna hate it and she says you're gonna hate it you hate everything to be fair and he's like yeah that's true uh, but I think his willingness to give it a try uh, leads to a very heartwarming moment in the series that I will think of uh, as the series we're, we're close to wrapping it up. Just that image of, of both of them on the rock and this moment of peace and the sun setting in the distance and uh, the serenity of Pabu. Like, I think that's an all timer shot for the Bad Batch series overall, uh, especially considering what's to come in uh, Point of No Return. It, it it really is that calm before the storm and it's one that we kind of needed. I think it crossed her kind of has this moment of realization too of like, she's actually pretty capable and she's dealt, she's had to deal with a lot because her kind of unique position is not all that different from his unique position. 
right? Like I, he's been on the outside because he's um, a bad batcher and he's kind of always had this unique point of view with the other bad batchers, uh, you know, alongside the clone community. And Omega is also an outsider. And I think in kind of this moment, um, it's not that he doesn't know that, but maybe he doubts it because of her age or doubts her experience because of her age. But I think there's some sense of seeing oneself a little bit reflected. I got to appreciate, too, that the writers have included Crosshair's insecurity about himself and also his inability to recognize that, too. Like, he's kind of grappling with it. It's yeah. not in my head, AZ, and, and he, like, hits AZ, and AZ kind of just, like, does the old 3PO thing where you hit 3PO and 3PO falls away, and it's just like, oh, you know? Why would um, you do this to me? <laughs> yeah. So I think, that's, I think that's really interesting, and I'm curious to see how that will resolve for Crosshair, because Omega says... Just because AZ couldn't find what was wrong doesn't mean you can't fix your hand and, and maybe you're the one who has to fix it, right? And, and sometimes I, I think of uh, Chirrut Imwe, uh, or, or maybe it's Baze Malbus who makes that quote in Rogue One that's, that's thinking of uh, the only prison you hold is the one in your mind or, or something along those lines. And that can be true. And it's, it's interesting because Crosshair just came from a prison and he had a prison escape, but he still has a prison within his mind that he can't quite get out of all the things that he went through and the trauma and all of that is just still holding him back I think and and I think that's maybe the nerve and anxiety that he's feeling but can't really own up to it quite yet because I think he's afraid to acknowledge that because they're the bad batch they have the 99% success rate like they're perfect uh despite being quote-unquote defective clones like they're the best of the batch truly and how do you own up to your own flaws fallible heroes folks like I love fallible folks in star wars and dealing with dealing with that i think is very very important to see on screen i agree i don't know if i have anything else to add i think there i think there's something about crosshair as well and kind of dealing with this insecurity and dealing with this you know physical and mental struggle but like it's nice to have um a character like him dealing with that who's otherwise quite cold or um closed off uh yeah and he's always been the most skilled, I think, too. The most skilled soldier, at least arms-wise, right? Like, he's the sniper. He can shoot anything. I, I think the rest of the Bad Batch would like to have a word with that sort of state. I mean, yeah, but yeah, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Gunslinging isn't everybody else's, uh, you know, top characteristic, but that's, that's crosshairs, so it's, I think it's a little bit of a vulnerability for him. Uh, I do have to say, before we, we hop over to Harbinger... Uh, I did love the shout out of uh, Fennec Shan saying that Siler Saris, who is the like uh, grasshopper looking person that they're after, he took out some top bosses for the Haxion Brood, we learned. And the Haxion Brood being, you know, the, the folks that are after Cal Kestis and the Jedi survival, Jedi uh, Fallen Order video games, and also oh. Jedi Battle Scars. Oh, uh, thank you for Siler the reminder. Saris. The Slayer of Order Eris, which I believe Order Eris is where the Haxion Brood reside. So clearly this this dude is a is a dangerous, dangerous man, as we kind of see. Uh, I love some of the action sequences when they were fighting and he's like spitting venom at people's faces and stuff. I thought that was fun. You know, just some zany you, Star Wars. You were right. Every once in a while I can be. Surprisingly, Around I'm not, not often. Around 18 BBY, he became known as the or- Slayer of Odos- Ordo Eris when he double-crossed the Hexian Brood and killed several syndicate bosses and stole a cache of credits. Is that... Am I... Am I stupid? You just pulled out the BBY, so I think you're not stupid. I think you're quite the opposite well, of stupid. Thou, no, well, I... Anyway, I pulled out my bestie Wikipedia. I, I learned how to use a Google. That's how... That, that's why I'm the smartest. Anyway. That being said, let's move on to Harbinger, because I think this was uh, something that ended up being maybe one of my favorite episodes of the Bad Batch in the whole series. Mm. I, I, I think this is the one everybody was looking forward to, the long-awaited return of Asajj Ventress in Star Wars animation. Sarah, long you Long-awaited? Are... Well, oh, we saw her in the trailer. I guess why I was long-awaited. I was like, we didn't know. We didn't even know to wait for this, but then we did see it in the trailer. So at that True. point, we knew. Yeah. 
And all the Assange is alive believers out there are finally vindicated. They've been believing a lot longer than we have been believing since About that, tech? like, yeah. Well, yeah, true. <laughs> Zara, you are not a uh, avid Clone Wars watcher. And no. I know you don't have much of a history with, like, Asajj as a character, but, like, this is your, I, maybe, like, your first true introduction to Asajj? Um, I've listened to Dooku Jedi Lost, which is narrated by Asajj. True. Okay, yeah. Um, Great book. So we kind of get sometimes her kind of point of view and experience, but, um, yeah, otherwise this is kind of like my, but that was a few years ago. So this is kind of like my first big like, reintroduction to her. Very sorry to, I want to publicly apologize to Michelle over at Unknown Regions Pod, who has been so kindly bullying me to read this book for a very long time for Dark Disciple. I will get there eventually. I promise. It didn't happen in the past, you know, week. Sorry. <laughs> Illy. How dare heart. you not read an entire book to prep for this episode? Amongst um, all the I other mean, books we're been, trying to she's read. She's been, I know, but she's <laughs> been, she's been asking me to read it for a longer time than that. Mm. Honestly, a lot of people have. When people learn that I have a Red Dark Disciple, they're like, you know, double take what? How? Really? And the answer to that is, yeah, I don't know. And yeah. <laughs> One of Sarah's very uncommon L's, I would say. Uh, it's common L. Common yeah. L. Okay, but what did Not you what did you think L. of Asajj though? Like, what did you think of her introduction, her reintroduction? You know, again, for those listening, if you're not familiar with where we last saw Asajj, she met her demise or her her end apparently in the Dark Disciple novel written by Christy Golden. Uh, it was like back in 2016, 2017 or so. Earlier, uh, so it's it been 2015 or 16. Maybe okay. Well, it's been a long time. It's been it's a been while. almost a decade, probably since we. No, it's 20, 2015. 2015. 2015. Just go with me on wow. that. I don't know okay. why I know that, but I'm almost. I, we're gonna. I have to Google it. I have to know. Dark. So, what did you think though of of Asajj's introduction and 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 uh, where she's at in her story? Um. So first of all, I think she's got a really cool look and really cool hair in this particular look so um you know it's it's different than her previous style uh and appearance in past stories which i thought was cool um but i thought this was such an interesting progression of this story um because she's definitely to the audience and ultimately to the batch kind of a threat people know her as an as a villain people uh know her as a bad actor um, but she kind of exists a little bit more in the middle. And I think I spent a lot of my time with this episode kind of wondering what her angle was, um, and, and why she was helping. And, and maybe I didn't need to be doing that as much because maybe it was as, you know, genuine as it kind of came off to be. Well, and they're looking for sensitive information. You start asking about an M count and the age of the empire and you start to raise some eyebrows. And I think right. maybe that that played a part into Asajj's genuine intentions for her being like, OK, they're they're asking about something related to Jedi. So, like, I'm going to listen. I'm going to be maybe more patient than I typically would be and give them some benefit of the doubt. And I do love uh <laughs> Omega saying, "Oh, we know, we know somebody. We know a friend. Yeah, it's my friend." And then yeah. immediately after hearing that, it like has to relate to the Force. <laughs> she's like, "I'm a Jedi." Wait, <laughs> wait, my friend, my friend's a Jedi. <laughs> you know, like uh, Doctor, so. my friend, he has this thing on his butt. It's a rash. <laughs> uh, you know how to get rid of that? Um, nothing to do with any. Yeah, any, with not no, to yeah. me. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but. The the elephant in the room, which is so funny to me, like throughout this whole conversation of M count, is like, let's be clear, the word is midi chlorians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, midi chlorians getting a mention for like what the first time in twenty years since Revenge of the did Sith. Did they did they get like a name drop? Name drop though, or is that yeah? We still don't. Oh, okay, I missed. Yeah, Saj says the word midi chlorians. That's pretty. That's don't pretty wild. It. I did watch this episode. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a big and, moment. And also, like you know. Here, Omega is kind of pleading with her, like, I don't have any answers. I, I, I need help. And mm -hmm. so she kind of is like, 
okay, let's sort of figure it out. I loved the the parallels with The Last Jedi in this episode, especially because that plea that you just mentioned, the I, I it's kind of that I need someone to show me my place in all of this moment for Omega, uh, right? Yeah. And that's so cool. And it's all taking place in a cave. Like it's giving Octo, it's giving Luke Cave Island and yeah. Ray training and now Asajj and Omega doing some training. And it's like the same thing of like, why am I standing on a rock? Like I don't even know what you mean. Like, what does that even mean to open my mind and let it all in? Like, what, what are you talking about? Uh, and I think that's really funny because Omega is not somebody who's traditionally trained to be a Jedi. And I don't know if that's necessarily the path for her long term. And no. that's sort of the point at the end of the episode. And Asajj <laughs> is very honest about it. If you guys want her to reach her full potential, like, she's going to have to ditch you guys. She's got to come actually have somebody who can unlock that within her because it, it truly can't be any of you. And, and that's the truth, right? But I still really enjoyed the three lesson format that we follow of, you know, balance on rock and retrieve the white blossom. And then also like talk to this very cool looking. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't initially supposed to be the plan to talk to a big Bebo looking creature, a uh, giant creature in the water. But <laughs> you were like, it's so last Jedi. And I was like, it's so resistance. Yeah. And I think that is like the and, and all the all the meanwhile, it has like this really overarching ideal about the force and and what the force can be right um or what the force should be in a person and if that's not our sweet spot in some of our favorite star wars stories i don't know what it is like i was really delighted kind of by that and i love the monster who reminded me a lot of bebo's mom episode 11 of the first season of resistance guys entitled bebo go watch it um it's really good uh and then we got that moment where, you know, at the end of the episode, Asajj, um, you know, communicates through the force with this, this creature and it backs down. It realizes not being threatened, um, which I thought was one really, really awesome to see from Asajj. So like we do see her cut off one of like the tentacles, um, while Omega has been captured, but it's clear that that was self-defense essentially and or like defense for Omega rather than maliciously intentioned. Ultimately, by the time that, you know, uh, Asajj talks to this creature and kind of um, through the force and gives them that calm energy. And I thought that was really telling about Asajj. She was like, the Bad Batch is not helping. I can do this. And it's not like a they're looking down upon me or anything like that. But like, I have a different method that I can try that doesn't involve shooting. And it's cool because Omega seeing that moment, Omega has always been the character to uh, empathize and can and yeah. connect with creatures throughout the series. Like I think of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, I mean the Wookiees for instance, um, I think of the Rancor I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, the old Rancor from season two. Season, yeah. yeah, season yeah, two. Yeah, no, I, I remember it, but I'm going to say the wrong name and then I'm going to be really yeah. embarrassed that I've said the wrong name. Um, uh, obviously, Batcher, too, is a creature that she bonded with early in this season. So I think her seeing okay, there and being that for that I moment. I was going to say Muji. 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 Yes, so Muji. I was really, re I was like really close. <laughs> there we go. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I, I think uh, this quote from uh, Nika Futterman, who voices Asajj Ventress, they did a, an interview on StarWars.com. Uh, she says, quote, uh, that's the kind of side of her that I always knew that she had, but we didn't get to get there because you just see her fighting power, but not her mental power. Uh, I thought that was really cool. Um, it shows that she's closer to the light side of the force than she really is to the evil part of power, um, that there's some part of her that is more like the good guys uh, and that she's very capable of using her mental powers for good. So I thought that was a fascinating quote because it's, it's sort of speaking to this idea that We've always seen Asajj traditionally fighting against the Republic, fighting against Anakin and Obi-Wan and having the red lightsabers. And she's really flipped a page in her story. And maybe it's this new outlook on her second life that she gets to live. And we don't know uh, what happened or how she survived. And um, that was confirmed will be explained in future content. Asajj is somebody who I want to be kind of on the side of good because not that I wasn't rooting for her before, but I think when you have a character whose motivations are in the right spot, it, it, it feels more vindicating. It's like why we root for redemption in Star Wars is because we want the characters to choose that path and we want them to do better and we want them to see tomorrow, right? And not make the terrible choices that lead them down a path that will 
dominate their destiny and not allow them to have a future, right? Like we want to root for them. I also want to say, right, sometimes I do advocate for the villains being bad guys. Tucks hair sometimes, behind the ear. Sometimes. I root uh, for the wrongdoings I, as well. Yeah. I, it's like the, I support women's rights and I support women's wrongs. Kind of. Assage is like the epitome of that phrase. Yeah. 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 She's pretty cool. I feel like I need to go back in time and read Dark Disciple um, and to get more of her perspective before, you know, second life Asage. Um She's she's interesting. I really liked the moment when uh, Omega comes back and clearly all chaos has broken loose and Asajj is forced choking Wrecker in the air and thing, things have just turned very south. Uh, and there's this moment where uh, she says to Hunter, I think that we were we are the same or something. And Hunter's like, we are not the same. And Asajj says we were pawns in the same war and we all lost. And I thought that was, mm. I thought that was the moment. I thought that was the moment that spoke so clearly to what her motivations are and what her beliefs are at this point in her life, because she sees how bad the, the empire is, how dangerous it's become. And knowing that she's like, I'm not your enemy. You're not my enemy. And I'm not choosing anybody's sides. I'm on my own side because that's the only side I can truly trust, trust and belong to and have control of is just me. I'm I'm on my own. Not that we can't partner up, not that we can't work towards each other's interests in, in a, a, a symbiotic way, but like I'm on, I'm on my own and I have to do it that way. Um but just the reality that so many people in the Clone Wars were used as pawns and it affected all their lives and it literally led to Asajj's death. You know, she was a pawn used by the Jedi and in in the aims of doing this mission and it led to her death and um, I think that's why she's just not choosing a side because even when she chose the good side, look where it ended up for her. Mm. You know, is this the first time that we? I mean, obviously in the trailer, but like, is this the first story that we've seen her lightsaber yellow? I believe so. I think so. Yeah, there might have. She might have had a not red saber in I think the one episode where she's like kind of a bounty hunter thing, but uh. I'm not the Asajj expert in the room. I would probably defer to friends like Katrina to, for that question. Right, right, but I, right. I think this might be the first non-Red Saber that we've seen. Cool. Although there was cool. a Del Rey sampler that somebody posted back from 2015 that includes Quinlan Voss and Asajj on the cover of it, of it and she's using a, a yellow lightsaber. Um, it's Phil Noto Is that art, on the actually. cover of the... Re- it's Phil Noto art. Yeah, it's a Del Rey sampler. Phil and I'm like, I need it. I need that in my life. I, where can I, can I get this on a poster? Uh, and that Asajj Ventress oh. looks closer to what we are seeing in the show now. Yeah, totally. Okay, I am seeing that. Oh, she, okay. She has a she has a yellow saber on the cover of Dark Disciple. Oh, okay. So she yeah. So she has yellow sabers in that book. I totally read that book. I promise listeners. No, no. Sorry, team um, (laughs) who has read that book and like Sarah, you're dumb uh, on the pod. I'm just trying to put the pieces in the timeline together because I don't have them otherwise. But yeah, no, the colors on the on the the cover are like the white background with a gray and red overlay. Quinlan and Asajj are in black and white with a little bit of like their their markings on their face that are like yellow or whitish and then they have their lightsabers which are like green and then the yellow so that's really interesting because she did have a red lightsaber like i'm not stupid here sorry guys this is this is one of my black holes this is like one thing i just don't know a lot of information about so most of asaja's life that we've seen her she's had red lightsabers also this 2015 sampler is buy now with one click on amazon and it's zero dollars so i'm buying no, it with one click no that's because it's the kindle version I know, but then I can get the art and then I can okay. screenshot it and I can make it my background. That's the goal Got here. It. I Got own it. it now. I own the sampler in e form. Uh, anyways. So, anyways. Uh, <laughs> a couple of other things I think were funny in this episode. Uh, Wrecker looking at them through the binoculars and she looks directly at him. <laughs> right. And he's like, How does she know she- we're watching? How? How does she know? Um, I thought that was a good moment. And uh, just again, I think I think the rapport between Omega and Asajj, just like two women talking in a Star War. Like, I always love that because like Star Wars is always very male dominated. So like, that's good. That feels women. good. 
And I like how she at one point she goes, I blame those three overprotective shadows for your lack of discipline, <laughs> training and discipline. I had those three overprotective mm, shadows. Yeah. I mean, like she's not like capital W wrong, but they are like, you know, a bunch of helicopter parents. But for good oh, reason, yeah. she keeps getting kidnapped. <laughs> totally. Yeah. She's kind of, she's kind of a valuable figure to other people for wrong reasons. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Next episode here. Identity crisis. Yes. So I think before we watched today, we thought identity crisis was going to be about tech and tech is alive. He's having the uh, identity crisis. Tech, we... tech or tech is alive or like crosshair, crosshair something, you know? Yeah, no, we're clowns. Um, but my clown makeup is still on because I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting down the theory. I'm literally so good at applying the clown makeup. Yeah. I, I'm like an expert at clown makeup application. Mm-hmm. You've never seen someone apply clown makeup as good as I have. Because tech is still alive. It, it is <laughs> permanently on your face every time we record. It is. And also Regan Johnson's trilogy is happening. <laughs> right, right. That's why we don't do video on this podcast. Um, despite the one or two people who have asked for it. Um, first off, why? Why would you want to see this clown makeup constantly oh, on my face? Right. And Sarah's it's... face. Right. And two, we have good faces for podcasting. Um, Sarah, who is having the identity crisis uh, in this episode? Me, as I watch <laughs> it going, what am I doing here? No, it's, it's Emery. It's Emery. Unexpected. Unexpected, but really delighted by it because, you know, early on in this season, well, at the end of last season, we're like, oh no, she's another... She's just like Omega. She's another female clone. She uh, is somebody who is in a really unique position. And even Omega's like, oh, she's a sister. Like she, she's on our side. She's just like me. And it's like, well, not necessarily. But then in the beginning of this episode or the season, rather, she ultimately does return the like Lula-esque doll to DIY Lula. Yeah, DIY Lula to her um, in, in a moment of, like, compassion, despite everything that's going on around her. And I think that was, like, the first, like, ooh, Emery, I got my eyes on you, girly. Um, and this is really, like, I feel like this was a really pivotal episode because now that we know that Omega's going back to Tantus, who will, who will be on her side? maybe emery so anyway let's let's talk about let's talk about the identity crisis what we learn so these have been like big info heavy episodes even though there's partially things we already knew like yes we knew m clown was midichlorians sort of a deal but like um you know the empire is taking other high m count kids and they're testing them trying to replicate what omega has m count can be cannot be directly replicated from the source so like you can't you can't take some M, you can't take some high midi chlorian blood and put it in somebody else and be like, now you have high midi chlorians too. Like that's not how it works. Um, but Omega's blood is the only binder that's proven to be compatible. Is that like I think that's the direct quote. I tried my best to <laughs> copy it um while watching. Uh so that was really interesting. Omega is clearly a, a link between these two ideas that in this project. So it's not necessarily you know, the high M count that's important, but it's like the, the binder in the blood, mm-hmm. the binding agent that like yeah. somehow just allows it all to coagulate and do its M count right. thing in the right. new host. Weird. Weird. You know, that's why Palpatine, his plan to return took so long because he couldn't, he couldn't bind. Palpatine right. had and, no binds. And like Grogu question mark. Anyway. Well, um, let's talk about that for a second, because yeah, we see let's. in this episode, there is a literal child, a little toddler creature who was, as soon as I saw the beginning of the episode, I was like, oh no, don't love their foreboding music from the, the kinder siblings. Don't love that. Um, don't love where this is going. And of course, Cad Bane enters the picture. Like I said earlier, Fennec might not be the one taking these types of jobs, but Cad Bane, absolutely. That guy has no soul whatsoever uh he's beyond redemption he's just like in it for the money and he'll do whatever he has to 
Well, but, he's like an he's an evil gunslinger cowboy. Yeah, guy. yeah, totally. So like he's got to stick to that image. But the imagery of of the pram that he brings in to the room to take that child is like so clearly a a, a, a parallel to Grogu's pram that we first meet Grogu in in episode one of the Mandalorian. Like, it's, right? You know who put him in that pram originally? Like, were they bounty hunters? Like, why was why was Grogu in that area that Mando rescued him? It was probably bounty hunters doing the exact same thing Cad Bane is doing. Totally. Find us, find us high M count subjects in the galaxy that still exists and bring them to Moff Gideon so that we can continue testing because whatever happens in the Bad Batch doesn't work out for the Empire. So they're, yeah, they're still Hemlock, struggling. Let's be so clear. Tarkin, Tarkin pops up and Tarkin's like, and, or Hemlock's like, the expenditures are worth it. And Tarkin is like, yeah, well, if you're not, if they're not, you're a goner. Hemlock's a goner. Oh, totally. <laughs> but also, I want to be super clear. But also, Tarkin is like that bitch. He's like, oh, don't stop spending money. And then <laughs> Hemlock's like, but the Emperor really wants it. And then Tarkin's like, well, why don't you tell me more about this? Can I get a little piece of the pie? And he's like, and he's absolutely like, not. Uh, no. <laughs> Tarkin Tarkin is that that bitch for sure credit Tarkin's like thanks for doing all the work I'm gonna step in and now I'm gonna take credit you know it's like you stand here amongst my achievements not yours right like Hemlock's shutting that shit down immediately yeah he goes I'm I'm way smarter than Krennic yeah yeah um but but yeah the subjects being kids I think is what really gets to Emery in this episode and, and why she's having that crisis specimens they call them specimens and i'm like ooh, this is yucky and terrible and i hate it and i think emery is also like this is yucky and terrible and i kind of hate it actually it's also making me think of just how far are you willing to go to appease like an authority figure type of situation of like Mm. where do you draw the line like when when do you stop taking orders like when the identity crisis is like uh, this is my job i have to do this to survive but also i'm like so strongly opposed to what is being done where do i where do i stop and um i think that was this episode for emery she's just like i can't i can't do it I, i'm not going to do it um she brings the lula doll to one of the children and leaves it at their you know and, and the episode ends with her looking over from the bridge and like i think that's the moment right there that's basically like she's all in as soon as omega gets back there uh it's it's over for hemlock you know he he totally. pushed a little too far in one direction and she's not having it and also nala say confronts her about us you know she goes yeah. to see nala say and is like tell me more about this program and nala say essentially says you know we're at an important moment right now you are overseeing it what will you do she goes i protected omega did it come at the expense of all these kids kind of um but she goes i protected omega so i think you know, um, Emery seems to already have empathy for the kids. And then when you put Omega in the mix, what are we going to do? Protect Omega. It's just a really bad situation. These kids look uh, sleep deprived. They look deprived of nutrients like they're in really bad shape. I think the toughest part is just is just this is happening and nobody knows about it in the galaxy. Like nobody. Nobody can stop it, but it, I think it like also adds a little bit of. uh it adds a little bit of urgency and importance to the mission that we know Quinlan Voss is eventually going to take on uh, from what we know in Kenobi, where we know he's going around on the path and rescuing four sensitives. So mm-hmm. I think that just adds another layer to that as well, that not only are we trying to protect four sensitive kids from Inquisitors and Darth Vader, ultimately, but like we're also trying to protect them from experimentation by the empire with whatever Palpatine might be doing. And maybe, maybe these networks learn about it based on what happens in the bound batch. Maybe the word gets out that like Palpatine has a plan and he's trying to experiment on, on young kids who are force mm-hmm. sensitive, like protect them at all costs. Do you think there's a scenario in which Omega and the batch rescue more force sensitives as part of like their ongoing work going yes. into the future, like kids specifically? Yes. Yes, because we saw, I don't know if it's this episode or the next one, probably the next one, that on Pabu, we're seeing characters that we've seen before in other episodes that they, you know, that have been rescued that are outsiders too. And they're on Pabu, which is like a safe place uh, up until this point, but it's fine. Uh, 
Yikes. Um, but, no place safe, you know, Sarah. Or no safe no, place. No safe place. No place safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> throwback. If, if you know, you know. Resistance uh, <laughs> fans, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that feels like a really clear direction for them to go. Um, we don't want this to happen to anybody else. Let's do what we can to keep these people, these young people, especially safe. And I think the series starting out with Hunter reaching out to Kane and Jarris and being like, I want to help you. Right. Mm. I, I feel like the, the writing has been on the wall, <laughs> the writing on the wall, yeah. uh, the path symbol and Obi-Wan Kenobi on the wall, literally. But wow. I feel like the writing has been on the wall since the yeah. series started that like this is going to be their purpose. And I, I tweeted that before the season started. I feel like. Wow, um, this is where like you wrote it. I, it's like I wrote it. Maybe I'm a ghostwriter on Resi- on, ghost uh, <laughs> on Bad Batch. Um, right. But I think I think that's yeah, I think that's where we'll end up. Um, but let's talk about point of no return, because I think we're we're getting to the point of like the end game of the series. The, and like, how do we you get could there? Say we're getting to the point of no return, no return. Maybe uh, <laughs> <laughs> this this is where I really wanted off the ride. Um, we we speculated with our friend Molly on the first episode of, of the season that we covered that we thought we saw Pabu in the trailer and alas it is Pabu in the trailer with CX2 uh the bad guy um getting the coordinates from Fee and ultimately ending up on Pabu and bringing the entire empire there um it was very surreal to see stormtroopers walking through the streets with flamethrowers and um and kicking civilians out of their home and kicking them to the ground and, and doing all sorts of bad things and just the occupation of Pabu because we know Pabu is like supposed to be the safe haven like we see the the clone cadets from earlier in the season are now living there and they seem to be living a good yeah, life exactly and that's that's what I'm talking about yeah it's 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 uh tragic like how did you feel with this episode because I know you were dreading the idea of Pabu being somewhere that maybe wouldn't be a sanctuary anymore yeah I I I mean, it it was an obvious place for this to go, I think. Um, And I don't think that it completely uh, rejects the future of of Pabu. Like, I like I don't think like it's it's over and done completely for Pabu or the people on Pabu. Like, I think safety can be found again. But um, it definitely sucks to see this beautiful place that was clearly like a haven for so many for so many different reasons. like destroyed and 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 people hurt in the process but narratively it makes a lot of sense and it makes it makes the tensions really really high um and so it makes omega's sacrifice really powerful um yeah it was hard it was hard to watch i was like the moment it started i was like oh no um but yeah I, o- omega handing herself over to the empire i i feel like was just such a really profound moment in the series because like you mentioned earlier with the helicopter parents and always trying to protect her and she, Mm. she's always always getting kidnapped. Right. And then here she is willingly giving herself over to help others. And I just think that is so brave and so courageous. And it it kind of just cements the idea that Omega is, is definitely a favorite for me in, in star Wars. I just think she is so unique and Ah, oh, God, it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot to handle. I think the music and, and just the, the tension of the episode really built that sacrifice up even more and, and like what it meant and the importance of it. And also the fact that she makes that choice on her own too, right? Wrecker's yeah. out of the picture. Hunter is in the ocean somewhere. Um, she really makes the choice with Crosshair and Crosshair helps her a little bit, you know, to refine the plan slightly. You know, mm-hmm. she wants to bring the tracker. We know that's, that's not going to work. That's why they're such a good so. duo. I love exactly them. right and I, I think maybe how would that conversation have gone if hunter were there like the plan might not have worked as well because he might have tried to interfere and do something different and that could have je- jeopardized everything even more and so I, I think i think that was important also r.i.p marauder yeah holy yeah. crap how did you feel so when the marauder blew up i was like I mean, not, not that expecting I... that i don't feel like i generally have like too many feelings about ships um in mostly but like it was, you know, like the Razor Crest getting blown up. It's like, why? Why? But the Marauder getting blown up in this particular moment, in this particular context, Pabu's been blown up. The Marauder's been blown up. What does home look like anymore? You know, where is home? Um, 
and how can we find home again? Um, and so I think it puts the whole batch in a really uh, like tedious or tenuous spot. What am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? A little like high stakes moment. Um, so it was really painful. <laughs> that was really painful because it just, it ups the stakes so much. Um, but I thought that the moment like between Crosshair and Omega in this episode is so great when they're working on the plan. And also I think Omega doing this requires a huge amount of trust, not only uh, in herself, which she's clearly trusting herself to make the choice, but in Crosshair. And I think like Crosshair needed that push. Now, did Crosshair make the shot? No. <laughs> Was that his fault? Uh, no. Actually, no. No, yeah. Um, like it wasn't a skill issue. It, it like you know the the popular meme reply <laughs> seems like a skill issue. Um, no, it wasn't a skill <laughs> issue. Like he was ambushed and he did his best to reset up and, and take that shot. And it would have he totally would have made it if it if the ship had just been a little bit closer. I'm in full belief of that. But I think that he will then now be a huge driving factor in getting Omega back because he feels that very particular guilt of missing that shot. Um and in doing that, uh, we'll have that moment in the next few episodes or the end where he gets the shot and it, everything is not like everything is, you know, rainbows and puppies now but like i think that would be an important facet for his character to redeem himself for omega um and ultimately kind of work to overcome his tremor i have very few demands as a viewer but one of my demands is we need the moment where it's take the shot and he takes it and he makes it you know with the trembling and it stops and he's just so focused laser focused and he does it and I, I was so convinced. I was like, we, oh, this yeah, makes sense because we got we have four episodes left. Like, this is the moment they need to get to Tantis. They don't have the coordinates. This is their only literal pun intended shot. This is it. I was shocked. He missed. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Well, it puts Emery back at the center of things, doesn't it? Like, right. I, like that's what's so narratively compelling. Um, but yeah, I think I think what does it mean to regroup without Omega and without a plan on the bachelor's side? Um, and, and does Omega know that no one's coming necessarily? It's a, it's a tough, it's a tough spot for these characters to be in for sure. And when we think about why these two episodes are coupled together as a two parter, I think you're right. I think Emery is the key to all of this because not all hope is, not all hope is lost. Like, we know that there's hope with Emery because of the actions that she has taken earlier in the season and in the latest episode. And I think seeing Omega back, it's not just like, it's just not one subject, Omega. It is like all the subjects, all the kids who are just like Omega, who just want to be kids and who just want to live a life. And so now it's, it's much more deeply personal for Emery. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, what an episode though. I think this is just like a standout two-parter I, both of them I, this, I think yeah both this week's episodes great. are honestly incredible to put together like yeah. they raise the stakes so high they they position two really important characters going forward in emery and crosshair um and now we wait to see where we go from here like it feels like this season feels like the momentum is continuing to build and continuing to build and I like really nothing has thrown me off the feeling, the good feeling I have about where I think the season will end. Like, I think it will be really emotionally satisfying and I'm really excited about that. Which brings us to the tech in the room or maybe not the tech in the room. No, as we think about as we think about the end of the show. He's, so. he's, he's got to be a part of the Calvary. I, 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 yeah. I don't know what you want from me, guys. <laughs> you want I, to, to me. OK, OK, here's where I have to I have to be real for a second. <laughs> to suggest that I just accept the death of a character when Mr. Filoni himself, Dave, if you will, okay, Dave. Oh, first name basis. It's getting serious. <laughs> Do you remember the Ahsoka Lives question mark? Ahsoka Lives exclamation point t shirt debacle? Mm-hmm. Nonsense. That is a man who lives he lives he lives for a little a little tease a little a little fun play about the 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 status of somebody's life or death okay he loves that shit 
Ahsoka or Ahsoka alive. Ventress, bring her back. I I understand this is this is really the work of um the amazing team behind the Bad Batch, you know, more so than Filoni himself. But I feel like as as an executive producer, Filoni's kind of vision is baked into the the the, the sense of animation, the world of animation. So right, like the larger skeletal really, structure of the show. Like in some I just want to make it really way. clear that I I am really not yeah. invalidating the the very hard work and very incredible work of people and that I really respect and admire in the Lucasfilm animation team um, as resistance fans now as bad batch fans to make that very clear. My point being it's star Wars animation has this problem. Uh, it's not really a problem, but like animation has this thing. It happens in live action too. Like it happens all over the place in star Wars. We didn't see a body. Therefore they are not dead. Like, I just don't know how anybody would expect me to believe this death has actually happened when it has not agreed to the rules of star Wars death, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like, um, like that's the thing. So I kind of seen like other fans, like do a little bit of policing online of like, they've said that he's dead, except that he's dead. And I'm like, I hear you. I get what you're saying. And I understand it. I understand it. But why would I do that? Like if the show is over and he doesn't come back, he's dead. That's fine. I'll be wrong. I'll be, it's fine to be wrong. Like I, I accept that, especially in star Wars. I'm wrong all the time. Like I am, and I'm happy to be wrong, but like, wh- 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 sorry, I'm a little, I've had feelings about this, but why would I believe it? Why would I believe it when we've seen it not to be the case so many times? Anyway, 100%. that is, that is the Sarah up on her pedestal microphone is in hand. She's not standing up, but the microphone is in hand instead of on the table. Um, so, you know, it's kind of serious. <laughs> why, why is anybody booing you? You're right. And you should say it. <laughs> some, there are some people online just <laughs> booing everybody. And I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you not to boo people, but I am going to tell you not to boo people in public. <laughs> but also living in our little delusions of grandeur about tech is not hurting right. anybody. Right. As long as you're not like directing it at people who are in charge of the show, like don't do that, obviously. But if you're just dabbling in some well, fun oh, speculation so I should, and I should not spend this ep- this episode, clip this and send it to Brad Rowe and Jennifer Corbett because <laughs> I had marked tech. I had marked down the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. kidding. Uh-huh. Which, by the way, I just want to say shout out to you mentioning Jennifer and Brad because this is their show. And like, I don't think nearly enough people online are giving them credit for all the hard work that they're doing. I keep seeing like I think Jordan Mason tweeted out like people saying. Baloney cooked. And it's like, he's barely there, right? Although I will say, I- even if he's not barely there, let's hope that Ahsoka Lives Magic is rubbing off on <laughs> Brad exactly, Rao exactly. and uh, Jennifer Corbett through osmosis, right? Like maybe he was just in, in the room enough times where, you know, it was a little airborne Ahsoka Lives energy kind of, mm, you know, breathing mm. that same oxygen, just kind of floated tech, the particles tech, in the room. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. The tech particle. The tech particle? Did we just invent like a really interesting particle. Star Wars idea? I don't know. Um, right. use it Lucasfilm just don't pay us it's fine you can use it uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it can be used for something you know I don't so, need to you know move out eventually it's cool right right totally totally um, you, keep your, you keep your money big corporation keep your money mouse yeah you need the money <laughs> mouse uh, I, I, I feel like I, I agree like I will accept it once the story is said and done I will be like okay he's dead fine as long right. as there's some acknowledgement of him at the end of the series like if he's truly dead we need a funeral scene. We need something that like no, no, no. makes it I don't, feel I don't, like he's still there, you know? I would like some emotional closure, but I don't need anything as dramatic as that. But I do think, did we talk about the tech goggles and the Lula doll? Well, I know we that mentioned it. going to be my next point. Yes. Okay, you want to okay. go take it away? Right. So <laughs> we were talking while we were watching this episode and we were like, so, so, so basically a plot point you watch, listen, are you watch the show? You know what happened. Okay. The, she walks into her friend's room and, and then she's like, I'm going to put these artifacts here or whatever, these things here. She's like, I'll keep them safe. Went until you return. And she's kind of like, uh, hello. Well, I don't know if I'm coming back, but she leaves text broken goggles and the Lula doll because Papu was the first place that really felt like a home. First of all, tears in my eyes. Let me go sob in a corner. Second of all, we were like, oh my gosh, our evil clone leader is going to walk in there see the tech goggles and be like that's me i'm tech it didn't happen (laughs) 
but I was convinced. It was okay that we were wrong. I thought that's you know why what I'm it saying? was being set We up. were wrong about like, the oh. shot. We were wrong about that. It's okay that we're wrong. <laughs> totally fine. But we're not going to give up hope yet. Um, and I thought that moment was so beautiful and so sad uh, because it does signal an end of sorts for Omega. And also an acknowledgement that like for the audience that like nothing is permanent for her and she's still a kid on the run and still a kid uh, at all. I don't know. She's, it, I saw a photo today or like a tweet that was like, oh, look at how Omega has, has grown. And it was like for season one Omega and season three Omega. And I was like, oh, she really has grown up. She looks more mature. She's taller. She's, she's definitely smarter and cooler and awesomer and better. And like, that's, that's all you can hope for as you get older is to be smarter and cooler and awesomer and better. Uh, but she's still a kid and she's still someone who at the end of the day has never been able to settle down. And that's a shame. I hope we get that by the end of the series for her. Yeah, I definitely think it's it's a, an emotional moment because she's leaving she's leaving behind a version of herself that maybe she no longer identifies with in mm-hmm. some way. You know, like tech is uh, a a part of her history. Uh, Lo, uh, Lula is a part of her history, like her her real childlike wonder about the galaxy right like she left Camino. she was learning so many new things about the galaxy and how it operated and now she's just seen and experienced so much it's like that part like that she can't be that she can't be that child anymore like she can't be that that you know those rose tinted glasses it's kind of like rose tinted glasses she's leaving behind glasses like text goggles are the rose tinted glasses right like mm. she can't look at the galaxy that way anymore so she's got to leave them behind because like She's just, she's just has to grow up way more quickly than she would like. And that's the reality of, uh, many kids in the galaxy. Right. And, um, I think it it kind of adds just layers to what I hope will be like the sort of not only clone liberation, but like child liberation in the end of the show, uh, of Omega kind of being a driving force there. And then all of her brothers being the ones who help the clones and help the kids. And it's just kind of this like and it's just kind of this like group effort. The cavalry has arrived, like right being the last episode yeah, of the series. Like yeah, yeah, they're sending everybody to to rescue. And um, I think Omega recognizing the the parts of her childhood that she had to leave behind on Pabu, she wants no other kid to have to make that choice. She wants every other kid to keep those goggles and to keep that Lula doll and to have a childhood of some a sort home. because she yeah. couldn't. Yeah, a home. Right. Like she slept in, in she slept in a, a ship like in the gunner seat. Like that was her room. Right. Like no kid should have to have that be their room. Um, and she wants when she meets these kids and I'm very excited to see like what those interactions are like. And, and maybe we learn more about these kids and in, in their lives before. But like she wants to offer that to them. And I think that will make the show very emotionally fulfilling beyond mm-hmm. clone liberation. Um, Omega is the centerpiece of the show. So I think that will be a huge part uh, in these next four episodes. I agree. And um, now is the time where we hibernate um, and then we awake on the next three or four Wednesdays Mm -hmm. to the final four episodes. So we will choose not to exist the rest of the time so that it goes by (laughs) quicker. I will be putting myself in a cryogenic sleep. Uh, Only to be woken up once weekly. <laughs> once a week. Yeah. Once a week at 3 a.m. Eastern on time. On a Wednesday. Yeah. On yeah. a Wednesday. Yep. Perfect time to watch TV. Um, mm-hmm. if, I do, if I do say so <laughs> oh, myself. God, it's, it's really so silly <laughs> when you think about it. So we're going to release it at midnight uh-huh. on, on the West Coast and 3 a.m. Eastern time. Oh, gosh. That's so kind silly of dumb. you. It's so dumb. It's so silly. Anyway. <laughs> don't worry about it just listen a, i'm just, I just glad had a moment outside of this listen i'm just happy acolytes in that 9 p.m prime time tuesday night slot we are so back i'm gonna be with a bottle of wine every week night i'm uh, very not every sorry. week night every tuesday night i, I should say that every week night I'm, I'm, i have control of myself but like every oh. tuesday night charcuterie's coming out the wine's coming out mm. it's acolyte time you're gonna have baby. to move your uh your video game night to not Tuesdays. Think about. Oh, you think you're about so that? right. Yeah. He plays from my games destiny. On Tuesday, my <laughs> destiny enjoyers out there. Reset day on Tuesday. Might Reset be in shambles day. for the foreseeable future. Sorry to whatever you are doing in your game and your game friends. 
That's really tough too because the new <laughs> Destiny final Destiny. expansion launches uh one week or no, sorry, it launches the same day as the Acolyte. So Oh. That's going to be really difficult. Oh. Mm. I'm really sorry for you. Yeah. Anyways, thanks um, everybody for coming to the Mario TED Talk. I'm also really sorry <laughs> to our non-US listeners who are probably listening to us rant about release times and they're like it probably was really good for me and now it's getting worse. So, I sincerely apologize um because I understand that time zones are a thing and um as someone who enjoys k-pop all the live stream concerts like like 17 just had a couple concerts and they started mm-hmm. at like 6 a.m 5 a.m my time um you know some bts concert in the past started at 4 a.m i so i get it i get it nothing is ideal for everybody um so my sympathy is good for me not good for everybody it's getting rough to balance all the interests you know um we're we just should have really we should cool have people. less interests i know Maybe this could just well, be sorry. the last episode of the podcast. Yeah, sorry, you know, just one, to, one variable, to one variable yeah. gone, you know, just it's <laughs> yeah. over. Um, yeah, you're going to go to Destiny. I'm going to go to K-pop. It was nice being your friend, but we'll never yeah. see you again. Yeah. <laughs> nope. This was a uh, contractual, nothing more. Um, right. And speaking of contracts, um, we only have contractually obligated to spend one hour together. So we are past the one hour mark. Um, <laughs> that means this is the end of the episode. Um, any final <laughs> thoughts before That's... we... Uh, are back in a couple of weeks. We'll be talking about episodes 312 to 314 as like a three block. Uh, And then we'll be back to talk about the finale on its own um, at at the end of uh, April. But any any final thoughts before we close out, Sarah? Finale at the beginning of May, bro. Oh, beginning of May? May 1. Wow. I know. Which is crazy because the Bad Batch started on May the 4th. That's like a real full circle moment. It's pretty cool. It's, it's like they planned over. it. You know? It's like they planned it. Yeah. Do I have any final thoughts? No, not really. Um, I feel like we've gotten everything out here. I just really would like to fast forward and watch all these episodes. So um, we'll get there. Just yeah. a couple more weeks and, and we'll have them and then it'll be over and then I'll be sad that it went so quickly. So, you know, I'll cherish this time while we, we have it. Yeah. I've been really enjoying covering the Bad Batch with you. So I'm, I'm kind of kind of sad that it's ending soon um we got two more of these so let's let's savor them while we can and uh hopefully tech is alive i will say i was incorrect about our he has risen week for tech um oh although asajj so asajj is risen that that's yeah she's risen she's also risen you know what i mean she's got that riz she's got that oh. appeal you know okay asajj ventress yeah. make me you... feel a certain way that's all i'm saying okay all right she got the riz <laughs> you as the kids would say you tried with you tried. that one. I know. I've been seeing that. I don't own that meme. I've just been seeing no, versions was, of was, he has risen, like, you know, rising he, up. And also in, he's risen. Like he has got Riz. He's got the Riz. Risen. He's the Rizzler. Well, for for the for the girlies who know, Taman has a song called The Rizness. So oh, wow. Taman has yeah, mm. it's it's quite a song. You should listen to it. It's really weird. Wow. Well, listener, if you want Sarah and I to riz you up a little bit more, uh, you can follow <laughs> us on all of our socials. Um, where we post all of our takes um, that will make you want to follow us forever uh, and be hey, your bestie. If you like K-pop. But most of them are bad tweets. Let's be honest. Mine are K-pop retweets most of the time. So mm, Yeah. Mine are mostly just talking about whatever's on my mind because I just, I just tweet like a stream of consciousness. But yeah, you can follow us on all of our socials. Uh, Letterboxd, Goodreads, Twitter, Threads, Instagram, all the places. Uh, make sure to leave us a five-star written review if you enjoy this episode. Uh, subscribe to the podcast we got two more of these for the bad batch and plenty of things happening over the summer related to books so stay tuned always books yeah it's gonna be always it's gonna books be good, over here good time yeah you're gonna want to stick around absolutely and we also have a patreon where tears start at a dollar and these really do help us keep the lights on here at friends of the force so we're super grateful to all of our patrons aj ben brian cheryl clay david deborah emma jennifer katie knights of ren leanne logan lucy Lindsay, matthew nicole rob ruth santa sky talkers tom topher travis and our newest patrons tim and nathan thank you all so much for your support we do appreciate it um and thank you for everyone who takes the time out of their day to join us for our Bad Batch conversations. Please share your thoughts with us on socials. If you have reactions to our conversations, we always love to hear from you. Uh, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Please be well uh, in this early springtime. Take your allergy meds if you've got allergies, because mm. I know I do. It's been, it's been rough out here. I'm getting better, though, which is why we're back in the studio. And by studio, I mean my office. And my office halfway across the country. 
I know. We should buy a studio somewhere in the middle of the country, like in Ohio. I know Ohio kind of sucks, but drive you know, there on a very regular halfway. basis mm-hmm. don't hey don't hate on ohio we probably have fellow listeners in ohio we're gonna respect our fellow Listen, westerners here i'm don't a know. michigan guy what do you expect what oh, do you expect but that, uh, let's be real like you don't have to hate on the entire state of ohio just because of it mm, a little bit but listen you know Boo. the ohio idea might not be bad because we can listen to our audiobooks of the books we're going to record about oh. on our drives to ohio at two times speed no let's notes. Pin this. Let's just pin it. Put a pin in let's it. Let's pin that. Yeah, we're that's putting good. way too many pins and things lately, but that's that's okay. Um, so we hope you listener put a pin in our podcast and keep us on your on your board <laughs> though in the future. So uh, until next time, everybody, may the force be with you always. <laughs> <laughs>